I want to talk about the brain and I want to talk about the brain and depression and I want to do this because I believe that we need a new, more informed, more integrated, whole person um, approach to understanding, working with, treating and healing from depression. I believe that neuroscience has a lot to offer us in terms of understanding what happens in the body and the brain um, while someone is experiencing depression. And, and there's been a lot of advances in neuroscience in, in recent years. It's not all about the serotonin. Um, a, a, there's a lot we need to understand about cell health, neural health, neural growth, flexibility, pathways. And so I want to open up some education uh, for you and share some recent learnings and, and then move on to the kind of stuff that can help um, support yourself or perhaps a friend or family member or colleague who may be experiencing depression. Bear with me on all the technical stuff because with these concepts uh, about how the brain functions, um, the, the suggestions for working with depression are going to make so much more sense. And they, these principles can be applied to the whole of life. That they're, they're not only about healing from depression. And of course they're particularly important in, in this context. I was lucky enough a couple of weeks ago to attend a two-day workshop run by um, Peter Rossal of the University of Queensland, neuropsychologist, teacher, author, um, lifelong practitioner with special interests in, in, in neuropsychology and also an incredibly genuine human being. So I'd like to share um, some reflections and something of what I learned over those two days and hopefully in that offer some, some meaning and some context and some understanding about what goes on inside the brain with depression. So, so what is depression? You know, it's a term that we use in everyday language as well as being a clinical term. In many instances, depression is what happens when stress after stress after stress piles up and we're coping and we're coping and we're coping and then suddenly we're not coping. And so the kinds of symptoms we'll start to experience are um, difficulties with sleeping, either getting to sleep or, or staying asleep or waking too early, changes in appetite or weight. We, we may start to lose motivation, lose interest in things that we used to like doing, um, find that our energy levels are very low, um, start having dark and, and negative thoughts, you know, lack of self-worth or, or feeling inappropriately guilty about things. And as a number of these sorts of symptoms start to stack up, then we give it a label of depression. But what really is depression? You know, what, what goes on the, in the brain when, when this cluster of symptoms in life start to gather together for a person? And, and in knowing that, what's really going to help? I'd like to share four lenses that, that Peter shared with, with me on the day about how science currently understands depression. The first relates to serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's a, it's a chemical that helps the, the neurons in our body communicate effectively with each other so that we can function well. And this particular uh, neurochemical, serotonin, relates to mood, to memory, to learning, and, and, when, and to sleep. When it's not working effectively, we don't, it, it doesn't hang around in, in the synapses, the spaces between the neurons long enough for effective communication. So we have a treatment with SSRIs, antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And they basically help serotonin hang about in the, in the space between the cells long enough for better communication um, in relation to sleep and, and, and mood and memory. Through SSRIs, antidepressants in general have their place and, and they can be helpful used in the right way. Um, they also have a big downside. They have side effect profiles that affect different people in different ways. We're only beginning to understand some of the impacts of long-term use of SSRIs on the structure and function of the brain. Um, 
one early area that we've had some data and feedback about is um, the potential for a reduction in, in the volume of the thalamus in the brain, um, particularly with children. And this is an area, an area of the brain that's regarded as a relay centre for all of our sensory information. Improving the, the efficacy of serotonin between neurons in the brain can do what we call improve the, the firing in the brain, improve the rate at which neurons fire and communicate with each other. Now that's great when neurons are firing around a positive or a helpful train of thought. It can be damaging and, and, and high risk where a client or, or someone is stuck in very negative um, or, or self-harm trains of thought. It can actually increase in some cases the, the rate of firing of those sorts of negative um, neural loops, negative thinking patterns and, and represent a danger to the person. So. But there's a lot that we're still unpacking and understanding about this. So yes, in, in certain circumstances, that can be very helpful. Um, particularly when coupled with talk therapy and, and increased insight on the part of the client and what we call an enriched environment where, where people are able to feel safe and feel supported, feel stimulated, feel engaged, um, feel enriched in, in, in terms of their sensory experiencing in life and in this kind of environment the um, antidepressant medication can be more helpful. Another way through which science understands depression is the debate around genetics and environment. So we know that there's a gene that produces 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin. And we have short and long versions of the allele in this gene. Though people born with a shorter allele here have more difficulty transporting uh, serotonin so that there is a, a genetic factor at play. However, we know that that creates only a disposition. And, and then in most cases, a genetic predisposition can be modified by a nurturing environment um, in early life. Minimal life stresses and, and a good support network and, and good, good coping strategies around life stressors. So that the genetic sets up a predisposition and it doesn't have to manifest. We, we do need to be aware that someone who's born with this shorter allele and, and the likelihood of a more fearful response to stress is, is twice as likely to experience major depression at some time in their lifetime. Someone born with this shorter allele and, and a likelihood of a more fearful response to stress actually has double the, the risk of contracting major depression at some time in their lifetime. Should someone be born with this genetic predisposition, this short allele around 5-HT, the precursor to serotonin, and find that in early life they're subject to abuse or neglect, that person actually has a 63% chance of, of contracting major depression at some point during their life. The third way that, that science, neuroscience, currently understands depression is in relation to the hippocampus. The hippocampus in the brain is associated with memory and, and it provides a context. It, it helps us understand that things will be okay, that today doesn't have to continue on repeat how yesterday was. It's, I, I heard Peter refer to it affectionately as, as the cradle of neuroplasticity. It's central to wellness. It, it helps with neurogenesis or, or creating new neurons and also with neuroplasticity. That's the flexibility with which we form neural links, make connections between our, our thoughts and experiences. It's important that the hippocampus is as plastic or as flexible as possible. This is where um, what helps support mindfulness strategies, being in the right here, right now. And, and mindfulness strategies in turn support a healthy hippocampus. It helps, it creates context, it helps us to keep making new memories, be in new moments and, and not rerun 
past difficulties over and over and over and act out of that place. So it's important that the hippocampus is as flexible as possible and its ability to do that is enhanced when we sleep. When we sleep at night, the hippocampus does its job and it prunes out neural links that would otherwise lead to stress. So when we have poor quality sleep, we have poor quality pruning and, and stressful links hang about with us for longer than they need to. Too much cortisol, one of the body's main stress chemicals, impacts the functioning of the hippocampus. Um, and in turn, poor hippocampal functioning impacts the effectiveness and the production of cortisol. When our neural systems are compromised after too much stress for too long, we get a decreased hippocampal volume. And that's a problem because it makes it harder for us to make new memories and to be open to new moments. So it's really important that we do what we can in terms of lifestyle to protect and ensure the healthy functioning of the hippocampus. The fourth and last way that science understands depression that I'd like to share is around neurotrophins. And these are a family of proteins that affect neural health and, and functioning. It's about nerve growth and, and synaptic strength. They ensure the survival of mature neurons and they have a role in producing new neurons and increasing the flexibility of the neurons that we have. So with too much stress over too long, too much cortisol over too long, we end up with what's called cell death cascades in the, in the hippocampus or, or cell atrophy. So from all that, we know that what we're looking for is to preserve the health of, of our neural networks, to um, optimise the ability of um, our bodies to produce new neurons, and, and to increase the flexibility with which we can uh, link from here, make new links, not just follow our old neural patterns. We need to optimise the, the production and the functioning of serotonin in the body, and we also want to take good care of our hippocampus, the, the feel good, be here, be now, make new memories, offering context part of the brain. Knowing this, we can start to undertake more activities that are going to support these desired brain changes and help us to stop reacting in, in this ongoing cortisol-based stress-induced repeating of yesterday um, and help us access more of our mind, more of the brain, to um, be, be more present, to access insight and, and, and take action on that. In this we're more likely to reach out to the world around us, to, to make helpful connections and to find healthy ways to have our basic human needs met. I hope you're beginning to get a sense of the more that we understand about the brain and how it works around mood, the easier it is to have some understanding and compassion for either ourselves or people around us who might be experiencing some depression at some stage in, in their life. And, and that well-meaning advice along the lines of just think clearly, sort it out, get on with what you need to do just doesn't work because there's not the neurochemical structure and functioning there to support that. So, so I want you to bear with me a little bit longer. There's a little bit more about the brain that I'd like you to understand. The next thing I'd like to share is the idea that there are three levels in the brain and that these three levels develop from the bottom up. Pathology, if and when it occurs, occurs from the bottom up. And so healing also needs to occur from the bottom up. The first level of the brain to develop is what we might call the reptilian brain and that's responsible for autonomic functioning. That's at the very base of the brain that controls things like um, breathing and hunger, autonomic functions. The next level of the brain that develops, the midbrain if you like, is what we call the limbic brain or the emotional brain. And it's, it's developed but not fully functioning at birth and it continues to 
to evolve. And it's responsible for things like social relating, for empathy, for our emotional well-being, and for management of, of stress. The third, the last in these three stages of the brain to develop is, is the frontal cortex, um, that the higher order brain functions that um, are unique to us as human beings. So in, in the left brain, we've got our logical linear um, thinking, more the masculine brain, if you like, and the, and the right brain we have here, our um, sense of intuition and creative abilities. This is where we actually do get to bring in new perspectives. To, to make meaning, to do our problem solving, generate options, create new ways of understanding, making sense of what happens to us. Doing something differently today than what we did yesterday so that we can get a better outcome. The next idea I'd like to convey about the brain is that these different parts of the brain all interact through neural networks and that communication happens between these parts of the brain when electrical impulses cause chemicals to be released from one neuron and, and find a home in another. Implicit in that is both neural firing and neural wiring. So the rate of firing of neurons connecting with each other and the map or path they take as they do that. So what happens when we have too much stress over too long a period of time and depression kicks in is that we have overactivity, too much firing in the lower parts of the brain, particularly in the limbic system, and not enough activity, not enough firing across the whole brain, including the frontal cortex. Basically, it means that we get stuck in, in stress loops, seeing, experiencing things the way we did yesterday and, and last week and, and the time before Not that. getting enough communication between the lower order parts of the brain, that they're reacting from stress and from old patterning. Not enough communication between these parts of the brain and, and the frontal cortex, where we can generate change and new perspective. I hope you can bear with me a moment longer. There's two more parts of the brain I'd like you to know about. And, and, the, and they both reside in this central part of the brain, the limbic system. And the first of these is the amygdala. The amygdala is the early warning system of the brain. It's a very fast system. It bypasses the frontal cortex. It's instant. And it, it's an instinctive response to potential threat or danger. So we need it, but we need it contained, not overacting. Otherwise, it derails the flow of communication from the, the, the limbic system into the frontal cortex. And, and so we can't think clearly and we can't figure out what our best possible course of action might be. So the last aspect of the brain that I want to talk about is the, the chemicals that support all of that firing. Of, of electrical impulse throughout the brain that supports things like sleep and memory and mood and, and well-being. I'll talk just a little about two sets of chemicals and, and we might talk about the, the stress-related uh, chemicals, cortisol, adrenaline and, and some of the feel-good ones like uh, dopamine and serotonin. Okay, so our adrenal glands are located just above the kidneys and, and they're often referred to as the stress factories of, of the body. They produce adrenaline, cortisol and norepinephrine. Now, we need adrenaline to activate our fight-flight response when we're under threat, when there is clear and present physical danger. It's a really handy body response when you need to jump out of the way of a moving car. It's a problem when it's activated too frequently over too long a period of time. You know, too much adrenal activation, too much cortisol pumping around our, our neural network is damaging to those neural networks. So the feel-good neurochemicals that we want in good volume and, and working effectively in our brain and central nervous system, we've spoken about serotonin, and, and that's the one that gives you the sense that, ah, that was good, what I just did, that was good. 
And the, the other one is dopamine. And dopamine is associated with fine motor control, but also a sense of pleasure and accomplishment in life. Okay, we're going to switch modes for a moment and talk about human experiencing and our basic needs as human beings. Because having these needs met goes a long way to a sense of health and well-being in life. And the way we go about these having these needs met is impacted by stress and, and, and by depression. So the four categories of basic human needs that, that Peter shared with us on the day that I'd like to share with you now. Uh, we have a, a basic need for healthy attachment, to know that when the chips are down, someone is there for us. And many of us are aware that this is critically important for, for children, for babies, infants and young children. It affects the development of the brain in a healthy or otherwise direction. It's also important for us as adults to, to know that there's going to be at least someone there for us when the chips are down. So we have a need for healthy attachment. We have a need for orientation and control over our environment. We have a need to feel good about ourselves, to, to protect and enhance our self-esteem. And we have a need to maximise pleasure and avoid pain. The two strategies we use to go about getting these basic human needs met are through an approach strategy or an avoidance strategy. People that are more free to go about um, seeking to have these needs met through approach strategies are, are more likely to experience health and well-being in life. For some, and, and for example, people that have not had secure attachment, healthy attachment as children, the more natural orientation is to go about having basic human needs met through avoidance strategies. So avoiding intimacy avoiding too much connection with other people. And in this, attempting to avoid being perhaps put down and having further damage to self-esteem, avoiding further conflict, so it, so it meets a need there of, of reducing stress, but it also reduces the chances to um, create dopamine and, 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 and to have pleasurable, feel-good experiences in life. So we can see this avoidance strategy as, as actually an act of protection on the, on the part of the organism, the human being. It can sometimes seem like the last possible thing that I could have some control over to minimise the chance of even more hurt and more damage. So if you or, or someone around you experiencing depression is engaging an avoidance strategy, so not applying for too many jobs perhaps, not getting out and exercising, um, not being social, generally withdrawing from the world. Let's start by having some acceptance about this. That there, there's a level in which it's a smart thing to do. It does bring a sense of safety and control in, in a world that it, perhaps in many ways is, is showing that these things are hard to have. So starting with some safety and acceptance around that. And from that place, we want to begin to expand the options and expand the range of environments where an approach strategy can be used and used safely. Another note on secure attachment and what happens in the brain around that. It actually releases oxytocin, which you may have heard of in recent years as the love drug. It, it, it's a chemical that's released in the body between mothers and babies around the bonding there. Also in intimate sexual loving relationships between adults. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very feel-good hormone. And it creates a resilience for us around um, comings and goings in relationship. So that there can be a sense of ease when um, you may be separated from a significant other. Um, and, and less distress and, and less of release of cortisol around that. In a more general sense, our, our brains need a constant reassurance of secure attachment in order to keep firing and, and firing in healthy patterns. 
A sense of safety, basic safety, is important to down-regulate distress. And if that's not been present for you for a while, or, or if there wasn't enough healthy attachment in, in your um, caring environment as a child, then it's going to be even, you can maybe find yourself more vulnerable around that as an adult. So a brief recap, but one of the reasons to listen to all of this and get your head around it is to help bring greater understanding and acceptance to the experience of depression. Again, it's not something we can just snap out of. There, there are significant changes to the neurochemical structure and functioning in the brain. So electrons fire differently. Uh, chemicals shift about in, in, in damaging and, and limiting and unhelpful ways. So this looping in the lower order parts of the brain is associated with increased stress, with, with decreased pleasure in life, with uh, avoidance strategies, with feeling unsafe, and, and with, with a, um, in a, a diminished ability to learn new things and try new ways, and generally with taking a protective stance in life. Okay, so well done staying with me to this point. And, and the big question now with all of this understanding is what helps? What helps create more of the good um, chemicals and hormones and, and less of the bad ones and um, firing across the whole brain, not just in continuous stress loops in the, in the older parts of the brain? So, and this is where the holistic um, aspect to, to healing um, comes into play. So I'd like to talk about things like nutrition, like exercise, like sleep, like knowing your values, knowing what matters to you in life and, and being able to take some small kinds of action uh, around that in, in a conscious way. About being in touch with who you are, your strengths, the things that energise you being able to set some goals in, in line with what matters and, and take action toward goal attainment. Being able to maximise your pleasure and along the side of that, the release of dopamine that, that again supports you in goal attainment, each supports the other. And finally, your ability to be present for yourself and, and present in life, in, in the here and now. And I guess that's where some of the mindfulness approaches come into play. And I'd like to talk about all of this in the backdrop of what we're calling an enriched environment, which is an environment that minimizes distress, but also maximizes opportunity for meaningful engagement with life. In an enriched environment, there's enough sense of safety, some through relationships or routine or, or, or the familiar, that the stress response can settle just enough that we can begin to access more of our whole brain and, and really make a difference to our situation in life. It includes fun and, and, and laughter, creating and being open to opportunities for that. Um, relaxation as well as exercise. Rest gives us the energy we need to get out there and exercise and exercise in turn helps us to de-stress. It burns cortisol and helps us to access calm and feel good hormones. So all of this enriched environment is going to support us into expanding our approach strategies rather than avoidance strategies to get our basic human needs met. Writing, like writing in a journal or a diary or an online blog, actually stimulates blood flow to the left frontal cortex and helps us in turn access more clear thinking. Activities like um, music and art, singing, dancing, more likely to activate the right side of the brain. Finally, talking, good old-fashioned talking, whether that be talk therapy, um, confiding in, in a, a trusted friend or partner, finding the ways, some kind of way 
to express something of what's going on inside to, to people that you know will hold that respectfully and I guess that involves sometimes baby steps in, in testing out trust and, and shifting gradually from an avoidance strategy into an approach strategy. So here's a bit of a checklist for you to follow. First up, sleep. I heard Peter Rossell say that sleep is the second most important thing we can do for ourselves outside of breathing. And, and we know that not enough sleep sends people psychotic. So if you're not getting around seven and a half, eight hours sleep a night of high quality sleep where you wake refreshed, you need to find out what you can do about that. That there's a range of sleep hygiene practices that um, are easy to access over the internet and, and I have one attached as well. Nutrition. It can seem all too hard to keep good quality food in the house. You know, good quality fruit and vegetables, whole grains, proteins, eating regular proteins, unprocessed, high value, high nutritional value food. When we're depressed it can seem just so hard to shop and cook and prepare and, and clean up and do that again and do that again. Find the small ways around that, whether it's buying higher quality takeout, whether it's preparing food ahead and, and, and keeping it easy to access, whether it's doing a deal with, with your partner or a flatmate. Um, also important to have a look at um, nutritional supplements. It might be worth getting some blood tests done if you've had some long-term stress impacts and depression. And perhaps there may be some depletion of core nutrients in the body that, that need supplementation. So you know, particularly if you're experiencing fatigue and low energy and, and problems with memory and, and concentration, you know, it, it might be worth going to see a good um, environmental doctor or just getting a good general screen done to see what the impact might be on, on your the nutrients that you need for the body to work. Exercise. What's just the simplest next thing that you could do? And that might be a stretch on the lounge room floor while you're watching the television. It, it might be just simply taking three deep low breaths down, down low into your abdomen. And just feeling the physical presence of your body. It, it might be teeing up with a friend or an exercise partner so that you're held accountable and there's, there's some support in doing that. What's the next thing that you could do to, to get some regular exercise happening? You need to maximise pleasure, which just may seem irrelevant and a long way from where you're at. So keep it simple and, and think five senses. What would it be nice to see or smell or touch or taste or hear? You know, what kind of mu music might either match your mood if it's a bit aggravated and up or calm? Um, yeah, but burning oils, having a little of something that you, that you fancy to eat just, and being present with all of that. And, and, and it's the being present with it that, that will help release the dopamine that's going to support this shift towards healing and, and approach and, and well-being. Around values and goals, maybe you've looked at that in the past in a work context or talked it through with a partner or written a five-year plan and, and it can be hard to access that kind of caring about life and ability to, to see you into the future and, and trust that good things can happen. But take some time you know, review different life settings and, 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 and what really does matter most. You know, in, around family, what's most important to you? In your working life, what do you most appreciate? What do you value? And, you know, write this stuff down and just see in, in the smallest way how you can start to increase your focus and action around the things that really do matter. Find find something. Taking action in the smallest way can, can start to build momentum 
and next week a little more as possible and, and next week a little more. And it's important that the small action that you take, and, and that might be doing some online research, having a conversation with someone, writing down ideas, do it with presence. Not, not kind of unconsciously in an automatic mode, but do it with mindful awareness, mindful presence.